Hello and welcome to this new episode of Smarter Tech and we're also on video now. I'm here with Daphna Takover who's an attorney advocate for safe technologies, a huge uh, fighter in this fight against, uh, well, telling the truth about electropollution and what it does to the human body and all things living. Daphna, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for all your wonderful work. Sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, it means a lot. And you, you've you been uh, all, all around the place. When I came across the topic of EMS, you were one of the names that came up with uh, you, you were with uh, We Are The Evidence, then in the last few years you joined uh, the team of Children's Health Defense, and more lately, uh, well, the last, I would say, year and a half, you, you've been also um, basically fighting on the legal front the FCC's decision, who basically said uh, there's no health effect and we will not review our guidelines. Can you tell people well, what the FCC is first and what the guidelines are and why they didn't change them. And then what legal action are you taking with Children's Health Defense? And I think there's various organizations there. So maybe give people some context about that. Okay. So maybe we'll start from, from um, the basics. Sure. So in 1996, the FCC was appointed by Congress to pass regulation or guidelines as to the health effects of wireless technology uh, radiation. Um, that was a weird appointment considering the FCC is not a health agency, but mm -hmm. actually a spectrum auctioning agency. They don't even have one person on their team who is a health uh, um, expert. Um, in 1996, the FCC adopted guidelines that at the time were already irrelevant. Those guidelines say that unless this technology, the radiation coming out of this technology, create a thermal change in your body, a temperature change in your body, that radiation is not harmful for you. That is the assumption behind the FCC guidelines in regard to wireless technology safety. That assumption is not something real. It's an assumption. It's not some, something that is scientifically proven. And in fact, thousands of studies even at the time, already thousands of studies existed that show that actually there's numerous non-thermal effects. So non-thermal effects mean effects that have nothing to do with thermal change. For example, neurological problem, uh, effects on the sperm, effects on the brain, effects on the heart, effects on the immune system, etc., etc., etc. So those guidelines were already obsolete when they adopted. Um, the FCC did not adopt, did not review the guidelines for 17 years. In 2012, there was um, uh, the, the Government Accountability Office of Congress wrote a report and said it makes no sense that the FCC did not review its guidelines for 17 years and said it's time to review the guidelines. They also said that it makes no sense that the FCC tests cell phone with a distance from the head when actually people use uh, the cell phone without any distance from the head. Yeah. So in 2013, the FCC opened the dockets whenever um, opened what's called an inquiry uh, as to whether or not the FCC should review the guidelines. So they didn't say we are reviewing the guidelines. They asked the public whether or not they should review the guidelines. Okay. And whenever government uh, is taking action, the government's supposed to open a docket, a place that the people can file comments in regard to that inquiry or rule or uh, any action the government is taking. So in 2013, the FCC opened the docket, it's called 13-83, and people started filing comments. This is probably one of the biggest dockets ever, and I'm saying it without checking all the dockets, but that's what it seems to be. Thousands of submissions were made by hundreds of scientists, hundreds of people who have been injured. Thousands of uh, uh, studies were filed to the dockets and documents. The FCC did nothing. Then in 2019, it essentially was forced to close the docket. So this docket was open for six years. And I suspect that the FCC would have never closed it until it was really uh, forced to close it. So in 2019, in December 4th, the FCC published um, a decision. Oh, there's no evidence, no need to review the guidelines. It's all safe and good. Um, and it was a pathetic decision. It's about five pages. It's like uh, this whole decision. There was a few actions the FCC was discussing in regard to uh, telecommunications technologies. Um, but the, the part that had to do with the uh, uh, guidelines was really pathetic. It was a total of 11 pages of which about five were really relevant. 
And um, basically that's how the FCC concluding alleged investigations of thousands of comments, thousands of studies, thousands, hundreds of comments of people are injured, no evidence, that's it. Um, that actually gave us 60 days to file a lawsuit. So it's okay. very complicated to sue the government, it's almost impossible. And I've been waiting for a year for the opportunity to sue the FCC, and that was our opportunity. The moment they closed the docket, we had 60 days to file a lawsuit, or it's lost, and we have to wait probably another 20 years to sue the FCC. Wow. And we sue the FCC, and our claim is that it's, it's under a law that it's called the uh, Administrative Procedures Act. And our lawsuit, which is called Petition for Review, claims that the FCC actions are capricious, arbitrary, uh, not evidence-based, uh, and abuse of discretion, which they absolutely are. Um, that was filed, the case, our file, our case was filed on February uh, 2nd, 2020. Um, in the Children's Health Defense case, we actually have, we are a total of 10 petitioners. Um, that's named for for uh, people who sue the government. Petitioners, not plaintiffs, and our petitioners include also Professor David Carpenter. Professor David Carpenter is one of the leading experts on wireless health effects. He also the co-editor of what is known as a Bioinitiative Report, which is the most extensive review of science on the health effects of wireless technology uh, radiation, and he kind of like represent the science scientific community in this case on, on our behalf, because essentially the FCC dismissed the bioinitiative report writing one line that the guidelines recommended by the bioinitiative report are irrelevant. That's basically all, the, all that the FCC said in its comments, although hundreds of patients for the pages from the bioinitiative report were filed, although hundreds of people referenced the bioinitiative report. That's all the FCC wrote. Uh, we also had two medical uh, doctors who are part of our petitioners. And, they're, and the reason they joined our case is because they see the rapidly growing sickness associated with exposure to this radiation, especially with what's known as microwave sickness, radiation sickness, or electrosensitivity, which is when people develop symptoms um, from exposure to RF. And you know all about that. You wrote this great book about it. Um, and so they are representing the medical community um, and um, about the sickness, the epidemic of sickness to really see in their clinics from this uh, technology, including among the, among children. One of the uh, medical doctors who were a petitioner, Dr. Toril Jelter, she actually a pediatrician, and she filed to the FCC comment in which she elaborated nine cases of children in her clinic with clear symptom from this technology and also clear improvement when the radiation was removed, including, for example, she, she uh, in her comment, she included um, um, a story about a child. Um, you know, he was an, he, an autistic child, I think he was 10 year old, and he, uh, her, her his parents came to her clinic desperate because he was becoming more and more aggressive and big and they could not control him and they were desperately looking for a solution and um and she told them turn off the wireless for two weeks at least at night within two weeks this child got better but most astonishingly he started speaking which he never did before that's incredible yeah. And I mean, these are stories that I hear, you know, I work with a lot of doctors and we hear them again and again and again. Um, and then we also have parents of four children who became electrosensitive and uh, cannot go to school or are, uh, are not accommodated by schools. Children who develop heart issues, mental issues, uh, cognitive issues, heart issues. So it's pretty devastating when you read what these children and family are going through. Um, another group filed a similar lawsuit uh, that was the Environmental Health Trust, and um, it was joined by Consumers for Safe Cell Phones, um, which is led by Cindy Franklin, and they also filed a lawsuit. Both cases, the way these cases work, um, whenever there is a government action, there are a few groups that file lawsuits. Mm -hmm. All of those lawsuits are joined together and are heard by one court, which is makes sense. You don't want the court to um, numerous court, I mean, uh, courts basically dealing with the same kind of lawsuits or claim yeah. again and again and again, they're making one decision. Um, we, we didn't have to, but we basically filed in a case what's called joint briefs. 
uh, we filed our main brief uh, in the case in July on July 29th. It's a 140 page document, which basically present our case. Um, then uh, the FCC filed its response to our brief, and that was in September 22nd. And then we have a right to write what's known as a reply brief, and we filed a reply brief in, um, I think it was October 21st, if I'm not mistaken. So um, that kind of like concluded the first part of the lawsuit. And um, then we had to prepare what's called the joint appendix. So while you read that there's no evidence and uh, that it's all conspiracy theory, we filed to the court 11,000 pages of evidence. So it's like 27 binders and it, just printing those documents was uh, $15,000, just printing. Oh my God. So, and, and the thing is, this is just uh, uh, the, this is not even all the evidence. Uh, we were trying to cut costs, so we cut, <laughs> you know, we, we just really kind of like uh, put into this uh, appendix like what was necessary. Now, what's interesting in these cases, these are complicated cases because there's a few reasons why, but first of all, it's not like a normal case in which you just go and choose the evidence you want to use and, and write whatever you want, which make, which make it right quite easy. In these cases, you're allowed to use only evidence that was filed to that docket. So we could use only studies that were filed to the docket, that people submitted to the docket, only comments that were made to the docket. And that makes things pretty complicated because for three months, literally, I was sitting and reading everything on the docket so I can find the right evidence uh, and the right sentences to include in that brief. So that was actually the most complicated. Well, not the most, but that was really tough work. And that's so six years of data, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's massive. Like you read every wow. document because you want to make different legal arguments, the, different uh, find the right evidence to support your claims like literally looking for those perfect sentences that you can quote and that was a pretty tough work so um, however the most difficult part I guess in this case was really cutting words we have word limitation and there's so much to say and so much evidence it was literally the, the biggest torture of the case was really uh, cutting words and cutting evidence and cutting what you have to say or want to say or need to say so that was pretty tough uh, the next stage of the case is actually in 10 days. Uh, we have oral arguments. And um, that was essentially going to conclude um, our part of the case. Then we're just going to wait for a court's decision. Yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's difficult. I've been, uh, I've been at it for fewer years than you, but I see that progress is very difficult to make in awareness. And we're, we're sometimes, uh, it looks like we're, we're, we're talking and being received with deaf ears. So how can you convince uh, judges and uh, that, that this is an issue when in reality, a lot of people have a bias that is not serious or, and then the FCC itself, what is the, the their argument? How, how can they even look at science when I've been at it for four years and maybe five and I would be hard pressed to 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 try to argue that I can read the science. If you're at the FCC, you're an engineer or you're a, a businessman or they don't have scientists at the FCC. So how can they even judge the evidence? <laughs> that is fantastic questions and it goes to the heart of the case. And um, so what happened in this case? Is, so so these cases are really difficult to win because they're not really about the evidence. It's about whether or not the FCC comply with mm. its duty under the law to review the evidence, both to do the review before and also in publishing the report and as uh, and whether or not that report includes the evidence, uh, includes sufficient argument and reasoning so that they have to prove that they did a, a reasoned decision making in reaching their decision. So that is the focus on the case. So in this case, we don't really need to 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 prove um, that non-thermal mm -hmm. uh, uh, levels of radiation cause harm. Uh, we need to prove that when F the FCC evaluated the evidence, it did not do a good job. It did not address the evidence. It did not ex it did not properly explain why it rejected the evidence. It did not properly explain why it reached its, it reached its, its decision. So since, as you said, the FCC does not have any health professional on its staff, that actually what the, 
that that is probably the game the FCC is playing. They always say, oh, we are not the health agency. We cannot evaluate the evidence. We rely on other agency to, agencies to evaluate the evidence. And in this case, we relied on the agencies and, and based on that, there's no evidence. What agency? Well, exactly. So that was like <laughs> the best part of the case. So um, essentially the only agency that, that, that made any submission to the record as we said, we can use only stuff that is in the record. It's the FDA. And FDA did not make a review of the science. All the FDA did in this case was to file two letters to the docket, one saying, um, addressing mainly the NTP study. And to those of you who don't know, the NTP study, it's the National Toxicology Program study. It's a study that was conducted by the National Toxicology Program, which are which is our premier agency when it comes to toxins. And, um, and they actually was nominated by the FDA to conduct a study that will give us a final answer whether or not this radiation is causing cancer. And they gave $25 million which is a huge amount of money to the F, to the NTP in 1999. And that study, while it was literally eventually two years, they designed it for, for over 10 years. So they built these big chambers and, and did every part of the protocols again and again to make sure that it's really a bulletproof study. And the results for the studies came out in 2016, clear evidence it causes cancer and breaks the DNA. So cigarettes cause cancer, this cause cancer and breaks your DNA. And clear evidence that is not just a word, that is an actual classification in regard to how strong the evidence is. So it's clear evidence. So the, the final, it's a long story, but um, you know, I'll make the, long, the story a bit longer because it's relevant. So the mm -hmm. NTP um, in 2018, um, there was an 11, a, a panel of 11 experts that was appointed to do the peer review process for this study. And the FDA kept on saying that the study does not apply to humans. And they, and they basically tried to dismiss the study that they yeah. funded, that they approved the protocols, that all the protocols of the FDA as to what requires from a study in order for it to apply to human, um, they follow those protocols. And that was the FDA was in that, um, you know, there were three days hearings in that, um, in front of that panel. And the FDA kept on trying to get the panel to reject the, the results. And the FDA position was rejected. And actually the panel approved the result, clear evidence it causes cancer. But nevertheless, the FDA basically that what it filed to the docket of our of our case, and they said that the NTP study does not apply to humans. Yeah, and something and, I, I, if I might add, something that is important, I think, at the end of that story, is that the independent review group took three days, which is longer than usual, to review. As, as a peer review process, right? Some people, skeptics listening to this are like, well, it wasn't peer review. No, it was. And in fact, what happened is that they raised the conclusions in, I think it was six or eight different categories from uh, little evidence to medium or from medium to high level of evidence. So in fact, they said to the NTP researchers, no, you guys kind of downplayed it a little bit it's 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 worse than you guys concluded so it's 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 maddening when at the end you have this classification clear evidence and it swept under the rug it just it made my i was a little bit i mean you probably were depressed a lot of people in the emf space trying to get the word out we hung on to the idea that, oh, maybe it's going to make a difference. And then it was literally swept on the rug. Like, oh, it doesn't apply to humans. It is ludicrous. Uh, incredible. Con pl please continue. So, no, no, it's actually really good. I mean, if you if you uh, allow me, I'm going to refine what you said. Yes, so when please. FCC, essentially the FCC, the NTP, was forced to publish the results in 2016. They did not publish the results. They were forced because of a Freedom of Information Act request by an activist oh, on our okay. side, wow. which is Louis Lassen uh, from Microwave News. And, and in, in a way, I think they were relieved that finally they can talk about the study. And not and so the, when they came with their what's called a uh, um, partial report, they said it's clear evidence. Mm. Not only that, in a press conference, they said, we must warn the public. 
Wow, Not yeah. only the public was warned, in 2018, they published what is known as a pre, uh, preliminary report, because, which is the report that went through the peer review process, and suddenly that clear evidence, not so clear. So in these two years, a lot of pressure was put on the NTP to undermine its own study. Wow. And so the report before the peer review process said it's not clear evidence. And then the panel, so that was February 2018. In March 2018, the peer review panel was appointed by the NIEHS, the National Institute of Environmental and Health Sciences. And they had a three days hearing in North Carolina, which is where the NTP is. And they, hear, they heard anyone who wanted to make a comment, the public, the FDA, industry, everyone. And that is a really thorough review process because most scientific papers are really being peer reviewed by two people. This was not reviewed by just any two people, any two scientists. It was hand-picked experts from the United States, 11 experts, not two experts, 11 experts that not just read the study and said yes or no, read the study, heard comments of scientists, um, as I said, industry scientists, uh, government scientists, and the public. And after all of that, they got to their conclusion. And you're absolutely right. There were like 11 type of cancer that were found in that, uh, uh, in that study. And they actually upgraded the uh, levels of evidence to all 11 uh, type of cancers. So they decided that the evidence is much stronger than the NTP represented in their preliminary report. And after that peer review process, then the NTP published its final report and essentially accepted the peer review uh, recommendation and its clear evidence. But that's again, not, not, not only, that's not only the evidence they found that cancer is important, but I believe that more important for me at least is the DNA damage because yeah. that is the ultimate damage. DNA damage is the ultimate damage and they found clear evidence of DNA damage. They didn't say clear evidence, it's, it's, it's clear evidence is regarding to cancer, but basically DNA damage. And DNA damage was already found in 1995, basically. And um, there are about, right now we have about 70 studies that showing DNA damage. The vast majority of studies that Correct. are peer reviewed, and I can put a review of uh, all these studies. I don't, I don't remember if it's Yakimenko or what researcher did it, but it's the vast majority of DNA damage studies actually show DNA damage. So, so that is the the Bio Initiative. It's really great. The Bio Initiative yeah. report. There is a series of analysis of majority of studies for different uh, uh, areas of study when it's come to EMF, and uh, and that. And that analysis is done by uh, Professor Henry Lai, mm -hmm. who was the first scientist to show that this radiation breaks the DNA in 1995. And when his study came out, the industry and the CTA actually um, um, took effort, what's called to war game his study. There is a Motorola uh, memo from uh, 1996, I think, that said, we sufficiently war game Henry Lai in his study. Well, the NTP fa study found exactly what Henry Lai study, and it showed that um, this radiation breaks the DNA in, in brain cells. And he's the creator of the comet assay, right? Which assesses the, or is, is he the inventor, one of the pioneers? No, no, the, the other author, uh, uh, I think, I, I'm not sure if I pronounce the name correctly. His name is Sink. He kind of like uh, behind that mythology that is a very okay. sensitive yeah. mythology that will be able to show the comet assay. I don't know if you have, if you're going to, if you can show that image from the study, I can. But but the reason the the reason it's called comet assay is because, so in in the in the image from the study you can see the perfect DNA which is before exposure, then you see exposure um, um, from X-ray what happened to the DNA after exposure to X-ray and you see the DNA and then you see a lot of small pieces like those are the fragmentation from the DNA damage and it looks like a comet. That's why it's called the comet assay. And then you can see what happened to the DNA after exposures to two hour of the Wi-Fi frequency, 2.45 gigahertz for 45 days, same thing. So um, so the evidence is clear and that's why you know the FCC determinations are, are quite ridiculous. And so back to your question about the agencies. So the only agency that made real comments um, uh, to the docket is the FDA. All they did was file two letters to say that there's no cancer evidence and that the NTP 
should not be applied to humans. And by the way, that that comment about the FCC, the NTP should, study should not apply to humans, as I said, was rejected by that expert panel and was explained why that's ridiculous. And again, so all the protocols of the AFDA were filed, uh, were followed, that should have made it clear that it should be um, um, applied to human, humans. Um, and it is, the study is really important because in 2011, um, the uh, IARC of the WHO, which is the agency in the WHO responsible for classification of carcinogen, classified this radiation as a 2B carcinogen, mm -hmm. a, a, a possible carcinogen. And what they said is that we do have uh, um, epidemiological evidence, we do not have enough animal studies. And shortly after the NTP study was published, another study was published, which is the Ramazzini Institute mm -hmm. study. It's another very well uh, regarded uh, um, scientific institution. It's in Italy. It was a, also was a big study, a 6 million euro study. And they actually had exactly the same result as the NTP, the same type of cancers. Um, and, and they actually used levels of radiation, which were like 6,000 times lower than the level used by the NTP. So the NTP used levels of radiation, which are more like cell phones, while the Ramazzini was more like cell towers. And that is really important, especially for the 5G issue. Hmm. And again, they found the same results. So now we have two major animal studies that were conducted by leading uh, uh, governments or institutions in the world. And actually, as a result of this development, um, in 2019, IARC announced that they're going to do a reevaluation mm -hmm. of the of the uh, classification of uh, RF, and it's going to be sometimes uh, until two between now and 2024, because it takes time for this evaluation to take place. So it's in the process, and they read and they wrote that the reason is that there is basically more scientific evidence, including mechanistic evidence. And that is also another very important issue. Not only we know that this radiation is caused various effects, so we have proof that it's causing various effects. We also have evidence of the mechanism that causes those effects. And that is what's known as the oxidative stress. And that goes to what you mentioned before the Yakamanko paper. So the mechanism that is a well-established mechanism is oxidative stress mechanism. And basically 90% of the studies show that this radiation causes oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is a mechanism of harm that uh, can lead to uh, cancer, non-cancer conditions and DNA damage. Yeah, and especially when you study real cell phones and real Wi-Fi, and that's kind of an, uh, I guess, an add-on. It's add -on a major the, point. Yeah, it, it's a major point. If if you review the work of uh, Ole Johansson and uh, Panagopoulos, they they did talk about the fact that the almost a hundred percent of studies who, who look right. at actual exposures from real devices find effects, whereas if you go with signal generators. Not so much. And it, it's really because then, of a lot of signal characteristics that aren't the same. So, And that is crucial. And that is, you know, yeah. it's like my frustration. So we talk about levels of radiation. Levels of radiation, to my opinion, and to a lot of other scientists' opinions, it's the least important element of the adverse or biological effect of this technology. I agree. So, yeah. you know, when, when you explain to people, you know, and when, when I go to people on the street and I want to kind of like make this real for them. You know, I see a mother holds the phone near her baby and say, hey, would you put your baby in front of a microwave oven all day? And she says, no, of course not. Well, say, that's exactly what you're doing right now. And even worse, and why is it worse? Because for example, you know, wife, um, the microwave oven uses a 2.45 gigahertz frequency, and it's the same frequency used by Wi-Fi. And the levels of radiation coming out of that microwave oven, actually the same levels as the radiation level from Wi-Fi. But Wi-Fi is actually much more dangerous than a microwave oven. Why? Because Wi-Fi carry information. So that 2.45 gigahertz frequency is not just a clean frequency. It has information embedded on it. And the way you embed the information over this what's called carrier wave is by using pulsation and also a lot of other frequencies. So essentially you have like mini waves inside that 
big 2.45 gigahertz wave. And that modulation is variable. And things that are variable are more intolerant to our nervous system. That is why, you know, when we do, uh, there's a lot of treatments that use pulsed EMF. And the reason there, for example, for, for pain, for, for uh, accelerate bone healing, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason they use those um, uh, pulsation or modulation is because that is bioactive. That causes neurological responses. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, that is really what makes this technology uh, so dangerous. And that is, that industry knows that too. That's why they keep the focus on the levels of radiation. And when they, when they fund studies, they fund studies not with the actual device, but only with the carrier wave. And that's why more than 50% of studies that do not have the modulation show no effects, while 100% of studies that use actual signal with the modulation show adverse effects. Yeah, so it's a lot of industry trick right there to find no effects, right? right and right. Uh, something I talked about in, on the podcast season one is the, the conflicts of interest and the fact that if you look at the, the, the funding of these studies, if you're a skeptic, think about funding. Funding, right? It happened with asbestos, it happened with smoking, it happened with big oil, big food, name all the big major industries in the world. Each of them had a similar playbook in funding the no effect studies until they got into so much trouble that they settled with lawsuits, right? So it, it's, it's a classic move, unfortunately, and it, it still continues. That's the way I see it. Um, I, I want to. I want to. Can switch. I say something about yeah, it? Yeah, the sure, thing sure. about Go it. Ahead. The thing about it. It's, it's you're absolutely right. And and the sentence I'm using usually, it's like they followed. You know, the tobacco and industry under industry. The telecom industry followed the tobacco industry and other industries' playbooks, but it actually perfected it hmm. because we're right now in a situation that we cannot sue for anything in regard to this technology. Our case yeah. against the FCC, it's literally uh, our last resort because all other lawsuits are preempted. Meaning um, we cannot sue. We cannot sue for damages. We cannot sue for I mean, for warnings. We cannot sue on this issue. All our rights to sue are preempted, and that is our treasures, and that's our really our la our case against the FCC. It's the last resort on this issue, and that's why it's so important. And one more thing about um, back to uh, back to agencies. You asked about the agencies. So essentially, the FDA was the only agency that supported the FCC decision, and it's not even supported it properly. It's all it wrote was stupid letters with no with no analysis, with nothing. Um, and they only addressed the cancer and disregarded all the other evidence, neurological effects, radiation sickness, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and actually a lot of other agencies, and that's what we claimed in our case uh, uh, to the court is that other agencies actually hold uh, a conflicting opinion. First of all, the NTP, <laughs> the NTP study mm -hmm. showed effect. And in our case, um, there was an amicus brief. Amicus brief is a brief filed by um, someone who is not party uh, to the case, but think that what they have to say is important. So it's like a, a, a brief from a friend of the court. And, um, and a brief was filed with a uh, statement by uh, Dr. Linda Birenbaum. Dr. Linda Birenbaum is the head of the NIEHS. Mm -hmm. She was the head of the NIEHS from 2009 to 2019. Uh, and the NIEHS is the agency above the NTP. And she said clear evidence of cancer. And furthermore, there is a, a letter from 2014 by the Department of Interior says that the FCC guidelines are 30 years out of date and inapplicable today. So basically, they're obsolete. Um, EPA continuously through the years said that the FCC guidelines only protect from uh, thermal mechanism and do not protect from long-term uh, effects of pulse and modulated non-thermal uh, uh, effects. Um, we have leading scientists uh, from the government um, that support our position. Uh, Dr. Carl Blackman, who used to work from the EPA, and he was one of the first scientists that showed effects of modulation. Um, Dr. Uh, Ron Melnick, who was one of the head of the NTP study. Uh, we have Dr. Alan Fry, who used to be uh, a scientist for the US Navy. And he actually was the first one to show the auditory effects, known mm -hmm. as the Frey effect. He was the first one to show that this radiation breaks the blood brain barrier. Uh, he was the first one to show the effects of modulations. So pretty big scientists are on our side. There's also another scientist from um, uh, the Department of Agriculture and 
fish and I forgot wildlife and fish services, which uh, uh, basically talks about the env environmental effects. Mm. Um, and uh, he was the head of the department and he retired and he is basically supporting our position. So um, uh, OSHA, um, NIOSH and OSHA. Okay. Said we, that we should apply. So there's a lot of agencies supporting our position, and that's our major claim: is that the FCC misrepresented the the position of other agencies. Well, so I mean, to to close on this, uh, I I really am sending good vibes your way that this <laughs> this goes somewhere, and um, that that uh, geez, that's justice is served at least that some the fcc can continue its work the way i see it uh selling spectrum and uh talking about the expansion of uh telecommunications in the united states but they should not be responsible for health effects it's it's simply uh, ridiculous um uh, so anyway i hope i hope that if if it if it's recognized that the fcc is not competent for this that Maybe they're going to form another committee. How do you see this working out? If if it's not the FCC, will they ask the FDA back? Will they ask? Will will they take the word of the NTP? Like what's going to happen? So I think I think that what's going to happen. I mean, it's it's really frustrating. Those cases are are massive amount of work, massive amount of money. This case so far cost us over four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. And um, and what we're going to get from this case is very little. Basically, all the court can do is say, well, the FCC did not comply with its duties. Therefore, we order the FCC to uh, rewrite its decision or keep the docket open now again so people can put you mm. know information that since that last decision till now a lot happened. As you know, there's, for example, the New Hampshire report, the diplomats report, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and then we have to go through the same process again. But what's important, what will be important is that finally we have a, a paper, a court decision that said that the FCC decision was not evidence-based. And that would be a good start for us to start and negate all of this uh, ridiculous claim of conspiracy theories, no evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Because right. that decision, we said that the FCC did not respond to the evidence in a docket and there was a lot of it. So um, unfortunately, that's not a lot, but that would be a good start. And as to what happens, I mean, nobody knows. We all know that our agencies, are for, unfortunately, are completely corrupt by industry power. Uh, our Congress members are funded by telecom and other industries. Um, so it's pretty difficult to, to get anything happening, considering the amount of money put um, by industry, in our case, the telecom industry, in Congress and in government. There is the report, which you probably know, um, the Harvard University report yeah. um, uh, captured agency that shows that, for example, between 2013 to 2014, industry put one $800 million in lobbying efforts in, in D.C. So it's, it's tough. I, I did lobbying in D.C. And yeah, I have a yes. quote from this report that's just incredible. They talk about the Telecom Act of 96. For those of you who don't know, it's a big uh, law passed by Clinton who uh, secured the, the position of telecoms, uh, made them, I don't know, secured their position with immunity on the legal standpoint, and you can't sue them for a lot of things. It's, it's, it's very difficult at the moment to bring justice because of this act, if I understand it correctly. Right. There's um, Section 7 of 4 of the Telecommunication Act of 1996. There you go. And that is when I said that it's basically uh, perfected um, the playbook. That's how they perfected it. They did it in a very smart way. So essentially that that law took the power from state and, and municipalities to regulate uh, the locations of cell towers um, based on environmental effects. And environmental was interpreted to mean health. So essentially, you, you cannot object the location and deployment of cell towers based on health effects. And that is really our problem right now when it's come to 5G. It was always a problem, but it was a problem when it comes to 5G. So for example, they put a cell tower three feet from your from your baby's window and you say, I don't want it. I know all this evidence. So well, you cannot say anything about it, sir. That's, that's preempted. Yeah. And even when the... And then there were court rulings that said that, okay, so you could not stop that tower and now you got sick from it. And if you want to sue for the damage that was caused to you, court says that because of this section, your right has been preempted. So you cannot sue for, for, for the damage that was caused to you. So basically that's why I said our hands are tied. We literally cannot sue for, for health effects anymore. Yeah. 
and that's why we're trying to change through this uh, case. It's mad, and he says uh, it's uh, Norm uh, Alster in the Captured Agency right. Report, page 10. He talks about uh, the decision. He says, Congress congressional staffers who help lobbyists write the law did not go unrewarded. 13 of 15 staffers later become lobbyists themselves for the telcos. It's it's a huge money party. I mean, so let it's, me tell you and the worst thing that people do not know: the main person in the Clinton administration that was responsible to pass this law, his name is um, oh I cannot believe his name just um, uh, uh, Rochetti, and Rochetti. Okay is actually Joe Biden chief of staff and he's been his chief of staff for 10 years. So after he passed, he got this bill passed, he left the administration and he became a, a, a lobbyist in DC. His first client was AT&T. He became the biggest lobbyist in DC. And um, in when, when Clinton was up for impeachment, um, guess who he called back to his administration, Steve Rochetti. He asked him to basically deal with the impeachment, which he did. And then he went back to private practice to be a lobbyist. And then um, when Obama was elected, and I, I should remind us all that Obama said, no lobbyist in my administration. Well, he appointed <laughs> the biggest lobbyist in D.C. to be Joe Biden chief of staff. And he has been Joe Biden chief of staff uh, for the past 10 years. And many people may not know, but Joe Biden's son, Bo Biden, who was the attorney general for uh, the state of Delaware, died at the age of 46 from glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is a cell phone brain tumor. And I spoke to members of the Biden family, and they told me personally that Biden, Bo Biden, told everyone that his tumor caused by his cell phones. And this is very disturbing because it we is. did approach Joe Biden and his family and Joe Biden knows exactly why his son died. And nevertheless, he did nothing so far to address this issue. That's crazy. And, and uh, I think, it, you know, it's I think it's a perfect segue. Cancer is, is one of the long term and possibly deadly effects of this electropollution. But it's not just about that, because what we're seeing, especially if you talk to medical doctors who have n n not the bias, it's all in the head and it's crazy talk, but they look at symptoms and whether people get symptoms from cell phones or Wi-Fi or cell towers, and then they remove these exposures or reduce them and they see right. people get better. Uh, it's it's well established and that's small fraction of medical practitioner and it, something you told me before the interview it, the term electrosensitivity and i still use it i'm i'm not very comfortable with it either because i mean it's let, let's talk about i don't know mercury is there a mercury sensitivity if you have strong effects from mercury no there's right. no safe level <laughs> are right? you sensitive to to mouse my mice uh, uh poison right or here we asbestos. <laughs> yeah exactly like oh well you get health effects from uh breaking uh, those you're, CFL light bulb. you're you're just you're just a sensitive well i mean if 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 you're uh already on chemo and you get uh another agent in you get poisoned by something Yes, you're more sensitive than me because I'm a healthy individual that's not on chemo, but it's not sensitive. It, it, it's 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 more like you're you're prone to be to to, to have more damage for predisposition. So let's talk about that term because uh, you've personally uh, been experiencing symptoms for many years. I've experienced them a little bit, but I met a lot of people who are debilitated by them. And in in the science world independent scientists, uh, it's well established that these individuals really suffer because of the signals and that reducing signals leads to partial recovery in, in certain cases and, and, and that it's not that much a sensitivity than a sickness, right? Well, it's, it's, uh, thank you for this question. Um, I think it's really important. I, I became, I developed uh, sickness from this technology in 2009 and I was one of those who literally crashed from it I, I could not be anywhere with this radiation I lived in my car for two years I moved to a very isolated cabin in the woods after that for four years in the Catskills I, I've been through hell with this um, and and those simple I mean I'm you know I've been a soldier and I've been an athlete and I know pain the pain I got from this technology was not pain it was torture 
um, uh, it's it's really torture. And we know about the ability of this technology to cause these adverse health effects um, already from the 40s, as even before. And actually, the first time our government started to investigate the potential effects of radio frequency and microwave uh, frequency based technology was as a result of soldiers in the Navy and in the Air Force reporting that they have exactly the symptoms you and I have, the neurological symptom from exposure to this technology. And that's when the investigation started. And as many of you know, in 1971, the Navy published a report with 2,300 studies showing effects. There's like seven pages there that have all the lists of effects that were found in a study and everything that all of us have been experiencing. And, um, and now we have the same thing happening again with our diplomats in, in, in Cuba. Um, they were suffering also for those same symptoms and the report that was uh, funded by uh, the Department of State and um, uh, basically concluded, yes, this is reaction to microwave weapons, but it's not really microwave weapons. What are microwave weapons and why are they different than wireless technology? Literally, it's the same thing. It's exposure to non-thermal microwave radiation. The thing is, it's how you use the pulsation and modulation. And that's what makes it into a weapon. The thing is, they know how to pulse a frequency to cause various adverse effects. And those are the exactly the same things that are happening with the, you know, all of the population. So I believe right now that about 30% of the population already have symptoms. We have surveys that shows that an average of 10% have symptoms, but that those surveys that were done by leading university are up to 2005. Nobody has done a survey since. And um, for my work, I can say that the, the rates are rapidly growing and we get you know, reports from doctors from all over the world and, and I see it all around me. Um, but yes, this is not a sensitivity. This is a sickness, this is injury. Studies that were done on people who developed the symptoms show very severe injuries. For example, there is a paper that showed um, uh, they did a functional MRI on 10 people who suffer from the condition. And they basically showed the same uh, injuries that you see in people with brain injury. There's uh, lack of blood, um, a lack of uh, blood flow to the brain, um, a problem with the frontal lobe of the brain. Uh, we have um, 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 evidence of broken blood brain barrier. For example, there's a study that was done by Professor Dominique Belpom um, that was published in 2015. And his study was done on 675 people who developed microwave sickness. And his study showed that between 13 to 28% of them had a broken blood brain barrier. And as I mentioned before, before actually it was a uh, US Navy scientist in 1975 for the first time showed that this radiation breaks a blood brain barrier. And most astoundingly, we actually have been using it for medical purposes. So Dr. Salford used it in his clinic to break the blood brain barrier of his patients in order to get chemotherapy therapy to their brain. So, uh, <laughs> and studies, and there have been dozens of studies that confirm this results, a lot of them by Dr. Salford himself in his lab, and they actually concluded that your blood-brain barrier can be broken by use of cell phone in a distance of an arm length from your head. From this distance, you can break your blood-brain barrier. And again, from the 675% um, uh, people who were uh, tested in that study of Bill Palm, 28% had broken blood brain barrier. So those symptoms that people are experiencing are evidence of severe physiological injuries caused to them by this radiation. Other physiological industry, uh, uh, injuries, 100% uh, uh, of, um, of the people in that study had lower melato melatonin production, which is crucial, uh, immune problems, um, uh, evidence of oxidative stress and inflammation, uh, impaired blood flow to the brain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So though this is not a sensitivity. This is an injury. This is a sickness caused by this radiation. The symptoms are indication of severe injuries. And yeah, there is predisp predisposition. I did not get cancer. I got microwave sickness. Um, so we all have our own predisposition on, you know what, maybe there are other factors that were involved in that. Maybe I was not eating well at the time. Maybe I didn't do enough sport. Maybe I was on a stress. Yes, but all of the predispositions and factors that uh, are relevant to every other sickness, um, even psychological issues that you may have in the time may, you know, you reduce your ability to resist, uh, um, you know, a toxin. But the bottom line is, 
this is not a condition you're born with. This is a condition you develop from exposure to this radiation and rapidly growing uh, percentage of the populations are developing. it. I, I agree a hundred percent. And you know, the, the, the reason I started even uh, steering away from EMFs a little bit and, and talking about electropollution is exactly that most people understand that air pollution is a huge issue. They understand that we should aim to reduce the levels. Uh, they understand that there's smog sometimes and it's not healthy to breathe. And they also understand that if your grandma has one lung left and the, the other one has been removed, she's predisposed to suffer more from the same type of smog in the city in the summer or whatever is happening outside. So she, they understand that certain individuals are more prone to getting damage from air quality. Same thing for electropollution. And in the case of electropollution, what's, uh, I guess the difference is that uh, the safety standards are completely obsolete. And that's really what you're trying to to fight back against this. Well, we're we're so permissive at the moment. Everyone is allowed to pollute on an electro pollution standpoint, and it's it's in fact the opposite. We're in the dark ages of electro pollution, where we're increasing the levels while people are getting sick, right? And then we're saying no, 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 they're not getting sick. People are kind of uh, metaphorically uh, coughing all the time, and we're like, no, 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 it's not the air. Yeah, it and is twenty year olds of- have heart palpitations, and and exactly. um, uh, and ten percent of children have ADHD, and and one in forty children have autism. Yeah, but it's becoming sick has become normal, and that is scary situation. It has, it has, and you know, I had the discussion with uh, Professor Holly Owenson uh, two episodes back uh, on the podcast in the new season, and, and and I told him that I told him, you know, in, in most fields that study chronic disease, whether it's the uh, autism research or the ADHD or the cancer and all the researchers there's a uh, even a mainstream consensus that I'm starting to see emerge that at least 50 to 70 percent of all these cancers and Alzheimer's and in uh, autism cases are environmentally environmentally induced and they say that in in big reviews of their literature but then they do not define what's environmentally induced well, and if they do and they don't mention EMF which is Probably the biggest most well, uh, contributor exactly. to this. And if yeah. they mention, even mentioning chemicals, they might touch on it a little bit, but it's a slew of different factors. And a lot of them have a big question mark. What is the contribu- the contribution of electropollution? I don't know exactly in each individual case, but for sure it is the most underrated, underappreciated and swept under the rug factor that no one wants to hear about because they might be listening to this very interview on their cell phone and then they say uh oh uh, i'm int- like what do i do so it's That's okay yeah and not just that i think i think it's even more funny because you know people get this high precipitation so now they put on them those eye uh, watches to monitor the heart when in fact it's that same radiation of the eye watch that caused their high precipitation it's like there's such a uh, uh insane disconnect i like the way you said it it's probably the most understated factor but i'm sorry i i am pretty much convinced that this is the most important factor and because you do see that um this major increase in rates of various environmental uh uh, induced conditions is in is especially in the past 10 years and then you ask yourself what changed in the past 10 to 15 years yeah and all people start telling me oh food oh i'm sorry guys actually we all have been eating much healthier in the past 10 years compared to 20 years yes. ago because there's a growing movement of the non-gmo of organic food organic food have becoming almost the same price as regular food families are more conscientious sure etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's false there is no factor except emf um some will say vaccines but you know what, I'll say there's a synergy um, that can explain that major increase in, a, in, in, in all of these environmental induced conditions, especially in children. We have now 51% of children under the age of 10, I think, have chronic condition. I mean, I was in school from 100 children, maybe one child was sick and one child had ADHD. Now it's 51% of children have chronic condition. What change? Yeah. And and also, for example, um, the data said that the four top diseases that kill children and young adults are brain tumors, thyroid cancer, testis cancer, and rectal cancer. Everywhere are, we hold or use our cell phones. So, um, you know, the evidence is clear. We are 
you know, the public and our, our government are insisting on looking the other way. And unfortunately, nothing will change until we take action to address this issue. And I think families need nowadays to take, um, you know, it's a tough decision. You know, I, I don't feel... I can understand person who have a strong cognitive dissonance on this, you know, it's not going to be easy to take your child's cell phones or tell them not to use it. And um, it's, it's tough. And, you know, um, they force us into using this technology that it become a necessity of life almost. Um, unfortunately, that is really what's causing the sickness we see all around us. And um, people will have to make tough decisions. So you have to make tough decisions. And I think there's two things you can do. First, on an indiv individual basis, you can reduce your exposure. I share a lot of free resources. Great. Children's Health Defense has a lot of articles. There's my book. There's my course. There's a lot of information online where you quickly get some tips to start reducing these health effects and, and start distancing yourself from devices and using wired connections. And, and that's good. And then the second part, I think, is spreading the word and helping causes such as yours so can you can you share as we we conclude here uh how can we support uh you we already have it in children's health defense anything you've got going on financially or otherwise so i think you made really good points i think you know the one area in which we can create change is our own environment and when it comes to radiation actually it's really important so radiation drops in the square of the distance mm -hmm. so if families stop using wireless devices in their home. They're already significantly improving uh, um, their health and, and reducing their exposure to this radiation. Yes. Many times people say, well, you know, even if I turn off my Wi-Fi, I still get a lot of Wi-Fi from my neighbors. Yes, you do. But again, the worst is the one in close proximity. So that is major. The other thing we need to do is continue and spread the word. So our biggest um, I think our chance is really, we are dependent on the grassroots. Unfortunately, our government is corrupt. Our current, uh, our legislators on the, on the state and uh, uh, federal levels are corrupted by industry money. So the way we are going to win it is, it, is by creating public awareness. And we've been do doing amazing work on that. You know, when I started working on this issue eight years ago, there was not even one scientist or doctor in the United States who was willing to talk about microwave sickness, not even one. Wow. And I got in the first media to be willing to write something about it. And we were trying to get someone, scientists to talk. Nobody was willing to talk about it. So we made a huge progress. Uh, we're in different times now. Um, but we need to continue and, and put the pressure and educate, educate, educate. Um, spread the word in your communities, in your, with your legislators, with doctors, when you go to a doctor, for whatever reason, bring material with you to show them um, the effects of EMF. For example, you know, doctors do get to read it eventually. When I was, um, I don't know, three months ago, I got a very interesting email and then a phone call from an MD, PhD in NYU, a leading university in this country. And he asked to speak to me about this topic and understand the evidence better. And after two hours, he said, you know what? Now I understand what I've been seeing in my clinic for the past 10 years, and I could not explain. Wow. So, and you know, and now this doctor is educated, and now he will talk to other doctors, and they will start realizing something's going on. So we're really dependent on the grassroots movement, on education. Um, and so this is what everyone should do keep on educating learn the facts don't talk you know don't make slogans learn the facts so if people ask a question you can actually answer um <clears throat> and then um supporting you know organization like the children's health defense in their effort as i said this lawsuit that we we filed against the fcc caused us massive amount of money and we're still fundraising for it and we're still not done um so if you can go to the children's health defense website and um <clears throat> and donate um, and you can actually, when you when you uh, decide, when you make the donation, you can decide to which of our projects you can dedicate your donation, um, and you can choose the 5G and wireless home project. Um, and um, we are involved in other um, work. Um, we led a big effort again, what's known as the Otterd uh, rule. Otterd is a legislation that just passed actually last week by the FCC that would enable wireless antennas on people's homes. 
um, without basically bypassing any applications through your municipality. Um, the uh, Children's Health Defense in May, uh, we wrote a legal letter to the FCC, export the letter with all the legal arguments, and we got 15,000 people to sign on that letter. So now all of these 15 people, a uh, thousand people will be able to be part of our case against the FCC for that. Uh, we haven't decided if we'll file a case. As I said last week, um, they made a decision and passed that regulation. We've been waiting to see what happened for seven months. Um, but that's a major one. Um, we'll just probably, after the um, oral arguments this week, next week, um, we'll make a decision how to move forward with the Autard. Um, so they keep on doing evil things. <laughs> And uh, we will keep on fighting as much as you can. As you know, the CH, uh, Children's Health Defense is really very proactive legally yeah. and uh, in terms of lobbying efforts, so educational efforts, and we'll continue to be active on this. Another lawsuit that the Children's Health Defense is involved, as you know, there is massive censorship on a 5G issue. And it's very easy for, for comp the telecom companies to do that because the telecom companies do control the, the media. Um, AT&T own... Um, on uh, Time Warner, which on CNN, um, uh, Verizon on Yahoo and AOL, um, uh, The Atlantic is owned by Steve Jobs Window, um, uh, Carlos uh, Slim, who is one of the biggest telecom entrepreneurs in the world, is, and uh, owns um, the New York Times, uh, Comcast on NBC, um, and we know that Facebook is basically um, invested, uh, Facebook and Amazon and all of those sort of, uh, companies are invested in 5G and other telecom initiatives. Um, and so um, we've been censored, including on Facebook, and we filed a case against Facebook for the censorship, including on the 5G issue. Um, so that's another big case we are running on this issue. And as I said, we'll continue and do what we can. Um, and so if you can support our effort, that would be fantastic. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Daphna. I know you're, well, I don't know if busy is an uh, under understatement. You're extremely busy yes. with everything. <laughs> you work so hard and thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank it's you. been enlightening. So please, if you listen to this interview and uh, you found anything valuable, share with with people. You, you'll see, Daphna is an attorney, right? There, These claims are backed by, <laughs> she's an attorney. We it's, work it's with not the best Nick, you know, attorneys in the world. Yes, it's, as, not, you know, it's not me who says these things. As, as an amateur author, and it's okay, I do, I do my work, but attorneys, scientists, medical doctors say that and um, do your own research, but it is rooted in science and evidence, and the evidence is almost overwhelming at this point, but the legal battles will be fought, and in the meantime, protect yourself and follow the steps that I teach at Daphna t teaches. And uh, well, thanks so much again. It's been, it's been massive. Thank you very much, Thank you. Nick. Thank you.